But Apple seems to be so far ahead in the mobile processor space that they can use a chip from a year or two ago and it'll still perform as good or better than competing chips out there. Welcome to Geared Up, brought to you by National Car Rental. I'm Andrew Edwards. I am John Rentner. And Geared Up is your weekly look at the world of consumer electronics and gadgets. And John, this was one of the biggest weeks, biggest this weeks of the year. the biggest, the biggest week of You're the right, year. The biggest week, because you were in Germany. I was, yeah, about three days ago, I was in both Germany and Istanbul, Turkey, while you were in Cupertino. Yes, I was down in Cupertino for the latest Apple event where they announced, you know, new iPhones, a new iPad, Apple Watch, services, etc. But what were you doing? Or can you talk about that yet? Yeah, I can talk about it. So I was at the IAA Auto Show. It's one of the biggest automotive shows in Europe and one of the biggest in Germany. Uh, I was doing some stuff with uh, BMW. They were announcing some hydrogen cars and I'm kind of the resident uh, EV guy, so I was doing some Instagram things for them and filming a video for Front Channel. Nice, nice. Did you have fun. a good time? I mean, I'm like, you like a kids? I don't always like being away that much. But it was fun to, I've never been to Frankfurt. I've been to Germany many times, but never Frankfurt. So it was cool to go. The people in Germany are always super nice. It was a fun trip, but I was happy to get home. Okay, cool. And obviously, as we just mentioned, I was here covering the Apple event. Um, I, I put out a video couple days after the event with my thoughts on the iPhone 11 and iPhone 11 Pro. You can find those at, or you can find that video at youtube.com slash gear live. It was crazy. A little behind the scenes. I've had this issue that comes up maybe once every 12 to 18 months where I get like a kidney stone attack, which is crazy painful. And this year it happened the night before the Apple event all the way through the entire day of the Apple event into the following day. And so (laughs) the Apple event trying to look normal and act normal while being in like severe pain. It was ridiculous. And so it was one of the few times where it was like, I got this, you know, obviously if you get to go to an Apple event, you get all your footage and you want to publish something. There's no embargo. So you could publish, you know, that day. And it was like, I can't even move. So once the event was done, I was like, I can't even publish. I couldn't do it. I couldn't edit. Oh, so it took dude. me two days. The video came out awesome. And um, Thank you. for anybody wondering why I wasn't there, check out the very first episode that Andrew and I did together yes. where, I, where I revealed why I am, at least for the time being, persona non grata at, <laughs> at Apple events after for now. being for now, after being there. But we're hoping to change that in the, in the near future. Yes. Now, however, though. Like I mentioned, I put out this video on the iPhone 11, iPhone 11 Pro. You put out a super cool video, which is, in my opinion, a must watch. And I ne- I do not use the term must watch loosely ever about what would happen if Apple had gone bankrupt instead of basically making the biggest comeback in corporate American history. Um, seriously, that was fantastic work. And maybe you should tell Thank people you. like a little bit of the behind the scenes of that video, because if you haven't seen it, go to John's channel. Tell people your channel where they need to go to watch this. Yeah, so it's uh, youtube.com slash John Four Lakers, J O N number four, then Lakers. So this is the biggest video production that I've ever been a part of. We had four different sets kind of rented in downtown LA. It was about five days of shooting and like two weeks of notes and scripting and, and research. And the idea was I've been watching a lot. Of, this is kind of uh, inside baseball in my life. I've been watching a lot of alternate history videos, like alternate, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like, what if, like, the Allies had won, Allies had won World War II? What if the French had won the Revolution? Like, all this kind of stuff. What if the Americans had lost the American Revolution? And it was fascinating. You know, and the cool thing about it is no, nobody's ever wrong. You can say what you want, and who knows? So it got me thinking, like, what would happen in tech if these marquee events didn't happen? What would the alternate history of, of tech be? So the initial idea was, what would tech look like if the iPhone didn't exist? But as we sort of talked and discussed it, it grew into something bigger. So what we did was we took three key points in Apple's history. We took Steve Jobs going to visit Xerox Park, where they first saw the graphical user interface and the mouse, and that sort of went on to become the foundation of their operating system. And then what people don't know is he also, Steve Jobs also brought Bill Gates with him a week later, and that's sort of where Windows kind of got its big start. So what would have happened if Steve Jobs didn't go to Xerox Park was one. We explore what would have happened there and what would have happened with with Windows. And the other, Steve Jobs was kicked out of Apple. 
he was booted and he went to go start next. And then things got really bad for Apple and it turned out that what Steve Jobs was building at Next was what Apple needed, so he came back to Apple. So the second point in the history in the 90s was what would have happened if Steve Jobs said, kick rocks, Apple, I'm holding a grudge, I am not coming back. And Apple was weeks from going bankrupt. You know, they got a, a huge amount of money actually from, you know, Bill Gates that sort of saved the company. And then the last thing we looked at was, what if the iPhone didn't exist? You know, what would design language be now? You know, BlackBerry was the dominant player at the time. What would peak BlackBerry look like now? What would, what would peak physical keyboard look like? What trends would have continued to develop and change? And what would have happened to Android? You know, Android was being developed as a BlackBerry competitor, you know, and then changed. So we kind of delved into all of that and kind of an over the top production, <laughs> over the top production. You say over the top, but I've got to say it really seemed like, first of all, when I watch the vast majority of my YouTube consuming, I do it on my TV. So not on mobile, not on my computer. And you say over the top, but really, it really did look like something you'd see on the Travel Channel or something like that. It looked like a professionally done video that a major studio or network put onto their YouTube channel. You know, if that makes sense. It didn't look like a typical YouTube video. It looked like a full on production. It was beautiful. Thank you, man. And, you know, it's kind of funny, double edged sword. So we got so into making a beautiful production and making almost documentary that we kind of mm. forgot we were making a YouTube Interesting. Video. And the video had to work for the YouTube audience. So we actually, we had to go back and reshoot a ton of this video. We, our initial intro was like a crazy epic, like walk through time, but we didn't get to the point until way later in the video. So we had to change and reshoot. So the next one that we do, and we've got more of these planned, we'll sort of, sort of keep that in mind. But the idea of this was almost treated as a pilot. You know, like we can go out to, you know, YouTube Red or go out to one of things and be like, tech is huge. You know, let us take a unique approach on tech. So that was kind of the impetus behind that video and kind of some of the problems that we ran into as we made it. And if anybody watches that video, I deserve no credit for the editing on that at all. I deserve no credit for cinematography on that. It was all the folks at Sun Squared that sort of made that video look amazing. So I just want to make sure I, I get wrongfully <laughs> a lot of credit for stuff that I didn't do. So that one definitely does not go to me. Hey, and that's what makes you a good man, by the uh, way. Well, you thank always, you. whenever you get a compliment, at least in my observation, you always turn it back to don't forget about this other person, or this other entity that helped me make it happen. Well, thank so you. Good on you. Thank you, man. Yes. So again, check out that video on John's channel, John for Lakers. Really, really good. If you're into tech, you don't have to be an Apple fan or an Apple hater. It's just a great video if you're into tech and consumer electronics, which you probably are if you're listening to this show. All right, let's move on to the Apple event. And let's start with, we'll do iPhone in the next segment. Let's start off with the Apple Watch. Now, if I remember last week, you were saying it wasn't really your thing. No, I love the Apple Watch. I wear my Apple Watch all the time. And much like I think the current generation iPad Pro is just about perfect, I think the Apple Watch Series 4 was like was just about perfect. I agree with you. And, you know, the one thing for me, though, ever since the first watch, well, the first watch, my complaint was apps take way too long to launch, which they pretty much fixed in Series 2 and crushed in Series 3. But the other major complaint that hadn't been addressed at all the whole time I've owned an Apple Watch was the fact that that I always had to do the proper wrist raise motion to see even just what time of day it was, unlike any other watch out there. And so when they started that video with the woman dancing and her watch was glowing all, you know, while she was dancing all over the place, I was like, they're about to solve my one big complaint, my one big annoyance, my pet peeve, and give me an always on display. And they did that. And that's where I feel like, okay, you've basically made the perfect watch for me. I don't think you're wrong. Uh, always on display is something I never even thought that I would want or need on the Apple Watch. And I think if I didn't do this for a living, I probably would not be upgrading to a Series 5. Having said, having said that, I do have two on order. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So, Fair enough. you know, we'll see what happens. Which ones did you, before I say which ones I ordered, did you go aluminum, steel, titanium, or did you go ceramic? 
Okay, so I bought ceramic on series two and series three. Love them so much. I remember you rocking ceramic. So when they got rid of it for series four, I was crestfallen. I was I felt betrayed almost by Tim Cook. And then I saw it come back this year and I was like, this is fantastic. But the titanium in the hands-on area looks so good. It was so light that I had to go titanium. So I got a space black titanium Apple Watch this time. Interesting. All right. What did you like about ceramic? I just like it looks so unique, like, you know, from across the room, like the first thing is like, I don't want anything I'm wearing to look like everybody else's stuff. So that almost always eliminates aluminum for me just because that's the, you know, that's the major one that everyone's going to going to pick. And the white one, the ceramic one, it's not just that it was, you know, more rare, but it just looked so different from any other watch and i also felt like it went really well with my favorite apple watch band color which is orange so i have the orange band and so pretty much every type of band that they offer and it always like the white and orange always seem to look really good and also is the color of like my brand of gear live the white and the orange so it all just that makes sense. tied together Fair. for me so i never had a ceramic apple watch I ordered a ceramic Apple Watch. Honestly, just, yes. just to see it. I remember seeing yours, actually. And that's the only person. That's the only time you've the seen one? The only time I've ever actually seen a person have it. I've seen oh, it in wow. stores. And I love okay. the way it looked. I don't know if I'm going to keep it. I've always been fine with the aluminum. So I've got, I ordered a um, space gray with a green band to match my green phone that I'm getting. And that'll probably be the one that I'll end up, probably the one I'll end up keeping. The aluminum. The aluminum. I'm a simple man. So you skipped both I did. Well, I guess aluminum. Aluminum is a metal, too. I was going to say you skipped both the metal. You skipped the stainless. And you skipped the titanium. Yeah, I had stainless the first gen, and it got scratched to hell. It, lo- it looked really it looked really bad coming into the year. So I was, I'm was i a bit gun-shy to try anything that's shiny. Yeah, I got you. So that, that kind of knocked it out for me. Okay. The other thing they announced with the watch is a built-in compass, which isn't just for a compass for telling directions, but actually allowing apps and third-party apps as well to tie into the compass data pretty much bringing any sort of app maps app or anything that uses your location into parity with the iphone which has had a compass since the iphone 3g yeah maybe i'm an idiot i think i just assumed the apple watch already had a compass in it like i think i I actually did that (laughs) i thought that too i was like what until i realized i I opened up google map or apple maps on my watch and realized okay it gives me the dot but it doesn't give me the direction i'm facing so yeah that is a nice addition and then going with apple's whole thing of the apple watch also you know not just giving you cool features but also kind of enhancing your life international emergency services calling if you have a cellular model no matter where you buy it, it will work in any country where it's supported, which is over 100 countries, and ties into fall detection. So if you fall and you remain motionless for a minute in any country, whether you pay for a cellular plan or not, your cellular Apple Watch will automatically alert emergency services. I mean, that's pretty cool. I didn't know. I thought you had to have the cellular activated. I didn't realize it would just work. You don't. That's pretty awesome, actually. That I, I didn't know. That's almost the reason if you travel internationally to get a a cellular model. Right, right. So, yeah, Apple Watch. I think a lot of people are saying it's not that big of an upgrade because you're getting it always on display. You're getting international calling and your or international emergency services and you're getting the compass. But I think when you add all that to what the Series 4 was, plus there is an updated uh, chip inside. They just didn't talk about it on stage. So it's a little it's faster as well. All that in one package to me. That is the ultimate Apple Watch that I've been wanting. So I'm happy. I, I think it's a huge upgrade for people coming from the three. I think for most people coming from a four, from a four, probably, probably sit it out. But I really do think the Apple Watch and the iPad Pro are, are almost perfect products. And the Apple yeah. Watch is so useful to so many people. And it's so far ahead of the competition, even just to make it slightly better, still makes it stand sort of head over heels versus yeah. the competition. I agree. Another thing they announced at the event, which was a little bit of a surprise, was a new entry level iPad. They have never announced an iPad on the same stage as announcing a new flagship iPhone. This was the first time they did that. And it was interesting because it's the entry level iPad, three hundred and twenty nine dollars. It gets a bigger display. It picks up the what do they call that? That little magnetic port on the side that you that lets you basically attach the smart connector. Yeah, the smart connector. So you can now attach the external keyboard to this iPad. Basically, 
the entire iPad line now, with the exception of the iPad mini, looks like, at least visually, the way they show it with the, the iPad, the keyboard, and the pencil, like a direct Surface competitor. Now, it, it competes with the Surface. The iPads sell way better than the Surface does, but Apple's really going all in on these devices are going to help you get work done if you're running iPad OS. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree. They're really holding on to that first gen Apple Pencil. I mean, they're really holding on, holding on <laughs> tight to that that stupid lightning charging pencil. They don't have pencil. a choice. They don't have a choice though, because the new Apple Pencil charges inductively on the flat side of the iPad Pro, and the other iPads don't have that same design. So there's nowhere to magnetically attach the new pencil. So they have to go with the old pencil with the lightning port. I get that they have to. It's just such a ridiculous design. I mean, looking at that, I mean, looking, looking at that, like you're holding a protest sign up when you have that thing charged in. It's, it's, I think it's such one of Apple's biggest misses that and char- <laughs> a protest sign. Charging them. Hilarious. You know, that and charging the mouse from the bottom so you can't use it while charging uh, are equally ridiculous. Now, getting all of that ridiculousness out of the way, making the iPad for the masses cheaper, bigger, and more powerful is an amazing way to go, especially as a lot of students are debating, you know, should I get a computer or a tablet? Right. What do you think about Apple continuing to use the same chip? So they upgraded the iPad, like I said, bigger screen, same price, $329, not bad. It uses the same A10X processor that was in the previous model. And a lot of people were saying, well, this isn't really an upgrade because they were keeping the same chip. But Apple seems to be so far ahead in the mobile processor space that they can use a chip from a year or two ago and it'll still perform as good or better than competing chips out there. So I can put on my, uh, I'm going to get a little MBA-ish here. The A10 chip is the same uh, chip that's in the current gen Apple TV 4K. And you do have like economies of scale, all the R&D costs that went into making that A10 chip that was now in phones and tablets has already been recouped. That's just straight up profit. They're really just paying the manufacturing costs of that chip and nothing else anymore. I mean, so there's so much money to be made using the A10 versus maybe going to the 11 or the 12 and maybe they haven't recouped all those R&D costs on. I mean, so it's just so much money by using that older generation chip that still by all by all accounts is very powerful. Right. And you're, again, you're only paying 329 bucks for this thing. Like that's, that's almost no, for an iPad. Oh, that's so, almost nothing. Agreed. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a huge win for Apple, I think it's a great way to get people into the ecosystem. I don't have the data on how many apps people buy per tablet, but even they're making money on the tablet. They're making money on the app, on Apple Pay. I mean, it's just a, it is a money printer for the company. All right. Up next, we're going to talk about the, probably what everyone's waiting for, the iPhone 11 and the iPhone 11 Pro and our thoughts on each. That's coming up next on Geared Up. Welcome back to Geared Up, brought to you by National Car Rental. I'm Andrew Edwards, and it is now time for the National Car Rental Story of the Week. As you know, Geared Up is sponsored by National Car Rental. And if you don't know, I also do a show with National Car Rental on YouTube called Technically Speaking, where I bring you the latest, my picks for the best tech for business travel. Whether you're business traveling or even whether you're going for leisure travel, there's a lot of tech out there that can make your travel more efficient or even more fun. You can check these episodes out at the nationalcar.com control center or go to youtube.com slash national car rent. The latest tech puts you in the driver's seat. National Car Rentals Emerald Club will keep you there. Once again, big shout out to National Car Rental for sponsoring Geared Up. And welcome back to Geared Up. I'm Andrew Edwards. I am still here and I'm John Rettinger. All right, John, let's talk about the main event of this event. It was the announcement of the new iPhone 11 and the iPhone 11 Pro. Yeah, the iPhone, the iPhones, they're here, they're new, they've been updated, and the first thing that I noticed right away was they look way better, well, you weren't there to see this in person, but they it's look true. way better way to rub than in, man. any of the dummy devices that any of the renders and any of the leaks gave them credit for. This happens almost every time there's a new design, people see the leaks, they see the renders, they say how ugly the iPhone is, how Apple has lost their design touch, and then the, the real one comes out. And it looks good. Same thing happened here. So also, Apple pulled a surprise. You know, everything's a bit leaked, but nobody saw that midnight green color. So 
No. Surprise. There was a surprise, which hasn't happened in a long time, with really That's any, phone, true. any phone announcement. Okay, so there were rumors that there would be a green phone, but it was the 11, not everybody what we ended up seeing. Yeah. And I'm not a big fan of green um, in, in pretty much any, any instance. I can't really think of where I'm like, oh, I'll take the green one. But both the mint green on the iPhone 11 and the midnight green on the 11 Pro both look fantastic. Which color did you go with? I went all in on midnight green. Nice. The second I saw it, I was like, wow, this is classy. This is fantastic. So, yeah, midnight green for me, which I did not think would be the thing. But let's talk about these phones. So first, we've got the iPhone 11. Six colors. You've got black, white, red, green, which is a mint green. You've got a purple and then you've got yellow. And the iPhone 11 is basically a 10R, but better for $50 less. Yeah, they're going to sell so many iPhone 11s. And they're that gonna was sell another a surprise. Billion iPhone 11s. I think what they did is brilliant. They brought in the second camera. Processor wise, it's the same as the flagship. You know, RAM wise, a little bit different. Already an hour of better battery life on a phone that already had amazing battery life. More color choices. I think they knocked out of the park. I think generally people who aren't holding the LCD, with the liquid retina display versus the OLED on the other phones side by side will never see a difference. I think I think they absolutely knocked this out of the park. It used to be that if you went the 10R, you had to give up 3D touch. And you're giving up 3D touch no matter what phone you get. Right. That's true. I mean, when people ask you what phone to get now, what iPhone to get, the answer is I mean, almost unanimously. It's, it's the iPhone 11 or before it was the iPhone 10R. Now it's even more so. Right. And it's interesting because last year with the 10R, the naming scheme made you feel like you were getting something less than because the normal default iPhone was 10s. You get the 10s if you want the normal one. If you go 10R, you're getting something a little less. Now, 11. If you want something higher than normal, you go pro, but base model 11, just psychologically, it makes more sense. It makes way more sense. And then to, to cut 50 bucks off the price is a really solid move. They are, they're really just, these things are going to fly. Right. And one thing I wanted to point out to people was I've been seeing a lot of people saying it sucks that 64 gigs is the entry level, which I think we can all agree like 64. Actually, not all. A lot of us can agree 64 is not enough, but it's enough for a lot of people. However, with the $50 price drop, you get 128 gigs for the same price that 64 was last year. So if you bought the 10R at 749 last year and you pay 749 this year for an 11, you're getting the 128 gigs. Yeah, which is, I think, a really smart, again, another another smart move. 64 gigs, I think, is laughable for Apple. I would imagine that 64 gig uh, SSD probably costs them 12 cents to put into the phone. <laughs> Between 12 and like, you know, 14 cents. So I think people can live with 64. I think offering 64 on phones are that expensive is borderline offensive. But the price cut does make going to the 128 more palatable. It is more egregious, though, on the Pro and the Pro Max, that those expensive devices are 64 gigabytes. I don't care how much cloud storage you use. Psychologically, it is horribly offensive. And then the fact that you have to jump up to 256, which by most accounts is too much for most people, is clearly a very calculated move by Apple to sort of incentivize people to make that push and then to charge more for 256. I agree with you on that one. The phones have better protection from the elements. Yes. They actually showed the iPhone 11 commercial was basically the iPhone 11 getting knocked around, falling off of tables, getting thrown into a purse, falling into the car between the car seat and the armrest and getting hit with all sorts of um, liquids. And the fact that these phones are fine being mistreated in that way. They say it's the strongest glass on any smartphone fastest processors in any smartphone, fastest GPU in any smartphone. And the iPhone 11 can now be submerged in up to two meters of water for 30 minutes, which is double the 10R. And the 11 Pro can go up to four meters for up to 30 minutes, which is four times what the 10R was. So they've done a lot of work on making these devices, making them Livable. last longer. Yeah, and we're lift-proof. Yes. Are you a case guy? I'm not a case guy. So I've used a case for the majority of the past year only because it was the battery case, which I guess leads us to talk about that next. The iPhone 11 gets one hour more battery life than the iPhone 10R, 
And by the way, they've changed how they quote battery life from talk time to video streaming time or video watching time, which makes more sense because how much talking are we doing on phones these days versus doing something like streaming video? So one hour more battery life on the 11 than the 10R, but then the iPhone 11 Pro gets four hours more battery life than the 10S last year, which gives it one hour more than the 11. And then the iPhone 11 Pro Max gets five hours more than the 10S last year, which gives it three hours more than the 11, which is already an hour more than the 10R. So they've done some crazy optimization here. Obviously the batteries are bigger, but the displays, for example, are also 15% more efficient. They've done a lot of work to make sure that these batteries can kind of stand up to the competition out there. Yeah, I really I like that Apple is ducking out of kind of the wars they started with the thinner, lighter, you know, battle that every generation of phone was going. I don't mind thicker, fatter, wider if it's going to last me longer. I agree. So let's talk about the differences between or the mental differences between you have an iPhone 11 and then you have an iPhone 11 Pro. There's been a lot of talk about what is pro? Does it deserve to have the name pro? What does pro mean? Are they not doing enough to make it so that it deserves the name pro? How do you feel about about the naming? So I'm going to take Apple's own definitions of what pro means when they announced the new iPad pro. So it was USB-C for expandability. That was a pro feature. It was a pro motion display. That was a pro feature. It was Apple pencil support. That was something they were really adamant was a pro feature. So if you look at those three key things as professional, by Apple's own definitions, there's none of those are on the iPhone 11 Pro lines. All they did was add more cameras and obviously give you more, more software enhancements with that and make a better battery life. That, to my mind, does not scream pro at all. We actually made a whole video on what pro means to Apple. And, and pro seems to mean more expensive. So pro I, means, yeah, so... Hearing you read that, though, playing devil's advocate, that is what a pro iPad is. And the pro iPad prior to that one did not have a USB port. For example, there was still an iPad Pro that had lightning prior to this one. And so just like I wouldn't say that we can look at another product line to see if the phone is pro or not, I wouldn't say, well, let's look at what the iMac Pro has and see if the iPad Pro is really pro, for example. So is it pro for a phone? So fair point. And I hope it follows the same cycle as the first iPad Pro didn't have it. The second iPad Pro did. I certainly would hope that, you know, the next gen, the 2020 phone will have it. And that's a fair counterpoint to make. So let me ask you, what's pro about the iPhone 11 Pro? So I don't know if I agree. You know, obviously it's marketing, right? Pro is a marketing term. So that being said, I feel like what you're getting with the iPad Pro is the best battery life in any iPhone, which last year, the higher end models did not have. It was the lower end model that had that. So this year, you're getting it in the higher end models, best battery life. You're getting all three cameras and everything that having those cameras can do in software like you talked about. You're getting what else? I don't even remember. Oh, that display. That's one thing that people are sleeping on, actually. That display, the new display, seems to be getting ignored because it's the same resolution. It looks so much better. It does a sustained 800 nits and it can go up to 1200 nits if you're watching HDR or Dolby Vision or extended dynamic range content. It looks so good. Like if you hold up your iPhone XS next to the display on an iPhone 11 Pro, so good. So that's an interesting point. If people are watching a lot of HDR 10 or, or Dolby Vision HDR content, the previous 10s and 10s Max, it would play it back, but it wouldn't adjust the color or brightness during the color profiles. It would just kind of it would just play it back. The 11 Pro and the Pro Max actually play it back to match the proper color profile. So if HDR content watching is important to you, then okay, this is a big big upgrade. And yeah, and the brightness will go up to 1200, like you set up from a thousand nits uh, on the previous gen, and two million to one contrast ratio versus one million to one on the previous one last year. So it's, I guess it's, you know, it's things like that. It's the little things in every different area. You get the biggest phone if you want the biggest display. I'm still not sure. Like, it's weird that the the lowest end model is like slotted in between size wise. But if you want the biggest display, you you go pro there as well. And then it's more protected from the elements. Like you have the, the better water resistance, for example, you drop it into a pool. It'll be fine up to 30 minutes. So there are things that are different, but is it enough 
to be called pro. Now, my opinion, you know, going away from what you just stated, right, which is here's Apple's definition. I feel like all throughout history, not just for Apple, but any company in the tech space that's used the word pro, what they've meant is this is our top of the line model. That's it. Most expensive, top of the line. So and the other thing I've been hearing a lot of people say is how is this for pros? And, you know, is this something that I would use if I was a pro, et cetera? I think it really is more, it's not that it's for pros, even though Phil Schiller will keep saying that in a keynote, pros are going to love this, pros are going to love that. It's more this phone and this other phone. There's two phones here. One of them is the pro phone and one of them is the everyday phone. Similar to if someone is just starting out you know, making videos. Today's their first day making video. And you compared them to someone who's been like Marquez Brownlee, MKBHD. You put the two of them side by side, which one is the pro? Not which one is for pros, which one is the pro? So I think it's more of that. Like this one is the more capable device. Therefore it's the pro device. Now, Apple doesn't say this stuff, but I think we can just look at the history of Apple, Microsoft, like any company that has a pro, a PS4 pro, for example, is the more capable version. It's the more hyped up version, souped up version than the standard PlayStation 4, for example. So, and I don't think most people are confused by this, but some people were telling me, well, it's because you're in tech and you do tech, you know, for so long, you're losing touch with the average consumer. I don't think the average consumer goes into an Apple store. It's like, well, well, am I a pro? Am I pro enough? I think they understand that a MacBook Pro is the higher end model when compared to, you know, a MacBook or MacBook Air. No, I mean, if you're using just based on that definition, then sure. But I I do think for people who maybe don't upgrade their phones that often, maybe two or three years ago, and they see the word pro, they may have a different thought on what that means. Do you think there's confusion? No, I don't think there's confusion. I think most people know that pro just generally means top end or more expensive. I do think people mean that. And it's definitely a talking point about, you know, like we've done, you know, what does pro, what does pro mean to Apple? And I think with the exception of the iMac pro really just means that, you know, it's, it's just more expensive. There's nothing really pro about it. I, I do think the iMac Pro, uh, iMac Pro actually is a professional computer. The iMac Pro and the Mac Pro are like the actual like pro stands for professional. And I feel like the rest of the pros stand more for prosumer. Yeah, I would agree with that. So let's talk about phones. You didn't say which size are you going with. Are you a pro oh, or a okay. pro max? All right. So I've always gone with the plus slash max size specifically because in the plus era, plus phones had the extra camera where the non plus phones did not. And that was the reason they were called plus. And then in the max era where the phones are exactly the same with the exception of screen size. And because one is bigger, it has a bigger battery. I've gone with the bigger battery just because, you know, I'm always traveling. I'm always out and about. I want to have that big battery as big of a battery I can. And like I said, I've actually used, I'm not a case guy, but I've been using the battery case with my 10 max this year. Well, I ordered all phones. I ordered all three. But I feel like I'm going to make a choice between the 11 Pro and the 11 Pro Max based on how the batteries kind of last, because I feel like I don't like having this big bulky phone. But whenever I take my tennis max out of the bulky case, I feel like, oh, wow, this phone is so svelte and slim and and light. So if I can use the 11 Pro Max without the case and still get that great battery life, and have it not feel too large in my hand, that might be the one I end up keeping. But if the regular 11 gives me that, you know, also great battery life without needing a case, I might even just downgrade a little bit because I want to be able to use the phone one-handed. So are you going to keep all three and use them just for filming? Or are you just going to keep one and that's going to be your phone? I'm definitely going to keep two. I'm definitely going to keep an 11. I got the green mint 11 and I'm definitely going to keep at least one of the two pros. One of the pros is going to be my everyday phone. I may end up keeping both just for if I do that, it would be for video purposes and not because I need two phones. Yeah. Interesting. I've always I've kind of the same thing. I've always gone the bigger phones. I have every single time a bigger phone has been offered. I've gone the bigger phone. I've always preferred bigger screens. I liked bigger phones when the iPhone 10 came out and there wasn't a bigger phone option. I remember thinking that I thought that was a perfect screen size. And then, exactly. It felt good. It felt great. And then, you know, the 10s Max came like, ah, I'm going to go for the bigger size. <laughs> right. I did the same. So to make this generation feel different, I'm going to go smaller. And I've ordered, I should say, I've, I've ordered both as well. And all three phones are going to the 11. So I may change my mind, but I'm excited to go 11 Pro in midnight green, the 256 as my daily phone with Apple Care and try to go without a case and try to have a smaller, less like bulky thing in my pocket. 
you know, the Max with a case is huge. I mean, especially if it's a battery case, it's like a so gigantic. Wait, so are you a case guy? Are you saying you're a case guy? I usually, just because my kids, I usually am a case guy because usually they're grabbing uh, it or, 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 or holding it or doing something with it or falls out of okay. my pocket. Okay, give them the 11. I'm going to try no case. I have ordered cases. I've, I've got cases here and I probably will end up putting one on. But I'm going to at least try for a little while to go no case until I inevitably drop it and freak myself out and put a case on it. This will be interesting to see how we both fare and how we both end up choosing yeah. uh, what phone to keep. We can revisit this every episode for the next two or three to figure out <laughs> yes. you know, where we're going to be. What color standard 11 did you end up getting? So I got my wife. First, I got my wife the purple, which isn't like a bright purple. It looks more like a like an Eastery purple. Was it like a pastel yeah, yeah, exactly. purple? Yes, uh, Easter egg. Yes. Yeah. Would be like the appropriate way to describe it. She was on an iPhone 10, so I think it'll be a nice, nice upgrade for her. And then I went green as well. I thought the mint green looked cool. It was different to something that, you know, when you're filming it, a black or a white, you've seen it, the red we've seen before. It's something that at least was sort of a new option. I agree. And that's the same mindset. It's like when you're making a purchasing decision, you're also like, what's going to look different in video when I put this out there? So you want to go with something that people haven't seen before. It's so funny. Okay, let's move on to another interesting topic. Well, first, let me say Apple Arcade, they officially gave us the launch date and price. Um, the launch date is in actually just a few, it's under a week away. It's September 19th, 100 games, four ninety nine a month, including your entire family. So you and five other family members. We knew pretty much all of this. We talked about this last week, but seeing it confirmed was cool. Seeing the game they used to demo it, or at least one of them, Frogger, to me was like, hmm, What's that baby ah, doing? Why Frogger? What's that baby doing? Come you're on. Me- you're a messy, <laughs> that that you're was me- the creepiest baby I've ever seen. You're a messy baby. <laughs> and also, I think more importantly, a month free trial. Yes, that is nice. One month free trial. So I think it's going to be a hit. Four ninety nine a month. Share it with your whole family. Nice job, Apple. The bigger service announcement, though, which I wanted to get into a little more. This will be the final topic of the show. Apple TV Plus. So Apple announced Apple TV Plus will be $4.99 per month for the whole family. So no extra fee to add extra streaming for the other family members that you have. So right off the bat, five bucks a month, we were previously talking about that it would be 10 bucks a month. Did that change your mind about Apple TV Plus? I think the pricing was the most reactionary move in the history of, of tech. And also, I want to make sure that people know you get a year free with any Mac or iPad or iPhone purchase, which is... Or iPod Touch or Apple TV. Correct, which is which is huge. Yes, and that includes refurbs. So if you want to save money and you buy a refurbished Apple TV or refurbished iPod Touch, which are very inexpensive, you still get the same deal. Which I think is tremendous. And I think obviously was a, a response to Disney Plus, which will have more content at launch. And, you know, since Apple did that, we saw Bob Iger uh, remove himself from Apple's board. He's, he's yes. currently running running Disney. Uh, I think it was a brilliant move. And Apple, I believe, took on about two or three weeks ago or a month ago, $7 billion of debt. They actually bought debt because it was cheaper. So they're going to take a big loss. I think that debt was used to take a loss for the first few years on Apple TV Plus. And this is ah, a- interesting. Okay. This is a brilliant way to do it, to produce more content. So when these these year things start to run out, if they don't do it again for the next gen phone, there's more content there. There shows people want to see season two of. There are more eyes. TV shows are net, are, are network good. If folks aren't watching it or using it, there's no use to it. So I think I it was a, a brilliant, brilliant move by Apple to sort of go this route. Very interesting move. Additional details on what you just mentioned about the one year free with purchase of hardware. Apple TV Plus launches November 1st, but if you buy hardware basically from today forward, you get that one year free. You have three months to claim it from the date of purchase unless you purchase prior to the launch of Apple TV Plus, in which case you then have three months from the date of launch, which again is November 1st. If you don't buy new hardware, there is a seven day free trial of Apple TV Plus. Most shows will launch by giving you the first three episodes of the show, and then each additional episode will be released weekly. And you can watch it on all those devices. Plus, you can watch it in Safari, Chrome, or Firefox at tv.apple.com. Now, a piece of data that I wanted to look at, I was curious. Actually, I was curious, and then Travis McPee, who makes YouTube videos, tech YouTube videos as well, what he said was, Apple just won this year. And I was like, what do you mean they won this year. And he was like, the numbers, they win this year based on their numbers. And I was like, okay, let me look into this. 
And so here's some numbers I want to throw at you. Let's see if we think Apple actually wins this year. Netflix has 151 million subscribers today, or actually not today. All the data I'm going to read you was from the end of 2018. So this is for the year of 2018, because that's the last full year that we have to access. So Netflix had 151 million paying subscribers in 2018. HBO had 140 million in 2018. Amazon had 90 million, which is Amazon Prime. So we don't know if all 90 million accessed the TV, but that's how many could access it. And then Hulu had 28 million. Those were the four I looked up. Then I looked at Apple's hardware sales. 18 million Macs, 160 million iPhones, 38 million iPads, and Apple TV and iPod Touch are not broken out but obviously, you know, there's sales numbers there as well. So even if you'd looked at if Apple TV plus was just offered to iPhone buyers, it would be 160 million people versus Netflix's 151. That's not counting Macs, iPads, Apple TV or iPod touch. And so the point here is Apple on day one, well, not day one over the course of the year could have more people who can access their streaming service than even Netflix has. It's staggering. When you look at it from that way, I mean, I I think it's just you're dealing with the number of phones that they're selling and devices that they're selling. That's a lot of people watching Apple TV+. Plus. I mean, I think it was a smart move from any way you look at it. When they did that, I was shocked. I was like, how do you counter this? Like, you know, Disney Plus is brand new. People are very excited about it. But I don't think Disney Plus is going to get more subscribers than Netflix does in year one. That's just my personal opinion. What do you think? I don't know. I think they got a real good shot at it. I think if you say year one is a full 12 months, I think they probably will come close, come close to Netflix numbers. I really do. Wow. Do you think that'll be through them getting enough subscribers to match what Netflix has? Or do you think it's a combination of them, you know, rising up in subscribership and Netflix losing subscribers to Disney Plus? Probably attrition, but I also think there's a tolerance to pay that price for Disney Plus in addition to what people are paying what people are paying for Netflix. I don't think people were going to pay ten dollars for Apple TV Plus in the way that I don't think still don't think people are gonna pay five dollars a month for Apple TV Plus, but they're gonna get it for free with their phone, so you know, they'll watch the morning show. I think enough people wanna see the Mandalorian, they enough people wanna see the Star Wars movies and the Marvel content and the Marvel shows that are coming that they will subscribe to Apple TV faster or they will subscribe to uh, Disney plus faster than, you know, a growth on, on Netflix. That is an interesting take. This is going to be really interesting to see how these services are doing a year from now. And I do wonder, will they report on the number of subscribers that they have the way that the current ones do that, you know, I've been able to read the subscriber numbers because Netflix, HBO, Amazon, Hulu give that information publicly. Will Apple say, a year from now, here's how many subscribers we have, like they do with Apple Music, or will Disney do the same? If the numbers are good, they absolutely will. <laughs> true, true. So if they're good, they will be happy to share it. Are you excited about For All Mankind? Based on what you said earlier, my assumption is that's a show that you had your eye on. Yeah, I, I think the show looks very interesting. I think the morning show looks looks interesting. What was the one with Jason Momoa with the blind sight? That one's called C. C. I was really excited for that until they showed the trailer. (laughs) Yeah, the trailer did make it look, oh man, it looked, sometimes a show or a trailer can be too epic to where it gets into the realm of being corny. Yeah, it looked looked ridiculous. Yeah, I felt like that's where we went. But the one thing I will say about TV shows is a trailer for a movie seems to be much more indicative of what you can expect from the movie than one trailer for a TV show that's going to have, you know, 10 or 15 episodes in throughout the season totally agree fair absolutely fair point yeah and for those who don't know for all mankind i I brought that up because john said he was into alternate history and that's the show where the space race is happening but russia wins the space race and gets to the moon instead of the u.s they get there first and uh, the fallout from that which i mean the premise is interesting and there's a lot of content i'm excited for there's only so many hours in the day though to actually watch this content right but there's gonna be a lot to choose from at least so you're getting Disney Plus, obviously. I did the you three have children. Years. I mean, oh, if yeah. you have children, Disney Plus is almost a no brainer. Although Apple is also putting in like they have a show called Helpsters, which looks like Sesame Street, like Muppets. And then they have a Snoopy movie coming as well. So 
I mean, I did what you did. I did the three years from D23. And oh, I, was like, yes. I was happy to pay for it. Yes. You know, that was the thing. When they did that promotion, it was like, how does Apple beat three years, you know, just under $4 and make people interested in their service? Their answer is, we'll just give it to you for 12 months if you buy any of our devices. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good way to get in people's hands because they sell a lot that's of it. devices. That's right. All right, John. Is there anything else we need to talk about from the Apple event? There was so It felt like it was such a packed event. It was jam-packed. So there's a lot of things that weren't announced, I think, which is something we talk about yes. on the next show. Okay. There's a lot of things still coming. We can let's tease the next episode. Yes. A lot of things still coming from Apple and a lot of things that are still coming that maybe haven't been leaked or rumored yet. Okay. That's your tease for next week. And that is it for this edition of Geared Up. Thank you so much for listening. Of course, you can catch John and I on YouTube. I'm at youtube.com slash gear live. And John is at youtube.com slash John for Lakers. Feel free to head over and subscribe to our channels to stay up to date on all the latest tech. Speaking of subscribing, you can subscribe to Geared Up in your favorite podcast app if you haven't done so already. Just search Geared Up. That's two words, not one in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts, Overcast, or really wherever you choose to listen. If you like what we do, please consider leaving us a rating and review. It really helps other people find the show. Geared Up is a Gear Live podcast, and you can see more from us at GearLive.com. Thank you so much for listening. For John Rettinger, I'm Andrew Edwards, and we'll catch you in the next episode.